remember, if you're, if you're passionate about it, you don't, your photos aren't sort of a, um, you know, you don't just go and do, take photos and think they're awesome. You're selling a product, it's, it's a product. So editors have got to like it, the people have got to like it. So you're just selling a product. So we started doing more and more of that. And then I started building it and building it. And then, yeah, I think they're back in the early 2000s. We do Marlamax, sport fishing, salt water, blue water, you know, French magazines. I think they're doing 20 titles a week. Modern fishing, we're just doing titles all over the place and just building, building. And suddenly realized that that's, that was, you know, I found that passion that was getting the photos and doing all that side of it. Yep. And just absolutely, yeah, blitz for us. And, and everyone goes, oh, you know, you get a lot of these young ones going, oh, how much money do you make out of it? It's not about the money. So I get to go fishing and do what I love every single day. So I never work a day in my life. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this week's episode of Impact Outdoors Podcast. And we had a great time recording this show with my good friend, Mr. Al McGlashan from all the way over in Australia, talking about his journey from growing up as a kid, loving to fish and hunt with his family, and how he's turned that into his passion and into his profession now as uh, one of the leading photographers and fishermen in the entire world. So I can't wait to share this story with you. It's truly incredible. Al's an awesome guy and uh, really glad I got to meet him a few years ago and uh, struck up a a great friendship over the last few years and stayed in touch and hopefully we'll be able to go over there and fish with him soon. So anyway, hopefully you enjoy this episode. Can't wait for uh, you to learn more about Al and all the great stuff he's got going on. And uh, please, if you haven't yet, go down, hit the subscribe button, like the show, leave us a comment, and check out the rest of our videos. That's all we ask. We appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot, and enjoy the show. All right. So, man, I can't believe this is happening. You know, uh, I've got Al McGlashan on the show all the way from in the future from where I'm at in the U.S. And you're over in Australia. How are you doing, buddy? Not too bad, mate. It's the other side of the bloody world over here, isn't it? Yeah. And now we're all locked up. No one can even get here anymore. Right. We're all isolated as. Yep. So I'm just happy that the delay is so short. There's, there's hardly any delay talking to you. So that's awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, you just got back from fishing today, right? Yeah, well, that's why I was late as usual. So Ords and I went out for a quick fish. We dropped coops off at school and we raced out the front off Sydney there. So you go past the opera house and, you know, the, um, was it Sydney Harbour Bridge? You know, drive out the front, caught some slimy mackerel, which I think are green mackerel or tinker mackerel, you guys call them. Mm -hmm. Caught a couple of those. The water looked good, so we ran a mile off the heads there, and like it was 23, 23, and yeah, 23 degrees, which is Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Yeah. And um, went, oh, that's good because we get a little black marlin, so we get two marlin runs here. You get the little black, which come down inshore, so because they obviously will spawn up in Canterbury, we get the monsters, and then the little ones come down with the East Australian current. They come down the coast inshore, and then offshore you get blues, blacks, or the bigger black stripes swords, sails, you know, and everything. Mm -hmm. So we went out and put the gear in. We only had an hour to fish, so it took a little while to get the baits. Yep. And then I had a teaser up beside the boat. Ords goes, oh, there's one. And there's a little black bar and swimming along beside the boat going, I'm oh, trying to eat the teaser. <laughs> Wound the live in, bang, got him on. Got him up, he got tail wrapped at the end, so we got him and just, uh, just uh, ran him with the tech beside the boat unhooked him, let him go, then raced back, went back and picked up Cooch from school. And he wasn't real impressed about that, I can tell you. He was very unimpressed. And instead he goes, oh, that's good. So tomorrow I'll call in sick for school. I went, no, tomorrow you go to school and we'll be fishing again. <laughs> I don't have that yeah. quite working the way it's meant to, but it works for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you got to serve your time, right? <laughs> exactly right. And he's a little tin ass because he comes out, you know, I think by the age nine, he'd already caught black, blue, and stripes. He'd already got a grand slam. And then he hooked, um, when he was 10, uh, a world record, like the small fried swordfish, and then pulled the hooks after two hours on, on 80 on it and goes, oh, man, that's the first marlin, uh, first billfish I've ever lost. I'm like, right, you deserve that. <laughs> you deserve that, little man. So, yeah, so... So we'll go, and, we'll go and take great delight tomorrow. Ords and I'll catch a couple because we're, we're filming it for um, Fishing with Mates for the series. Mm -hmm. So we'll go and catch them. 
film it, send him photos while he's in each and every class and just let it come up on the computer. Bing, bing. Oh, hopefully it get, hopefully get to, gets its yeah. attention out of it. Yeah. <laughs> you can text me some tomorrow too when I'm at work. <laughs> All right, I'm on to that. It's the best part of fishing, not catching fishes. Who can we tell who's really, right? really going to hate this? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna try to go this weekend. So, but uh, well, what uh, what season is it down there right now? Like, is it hot, cold? I mean, yeah, yeah. So it's the middle of summer for us. So it's the opposite to you guys. Yep. And so Sydney, we're pretty much I don't know. Today was 30 degrees. Um, That's warm. 40. There's a couple of 40 degree days. So it's 100 over 100 in the old scale coming across from the west from Western Australia, which we're gonna see probably the next few days. We've had a pretty hot summer. Luckily, it's, we've got La Nina this year, which is the wet version. You get mm -hmm. El Nina and La Nina, I think it is. Which yep. are, we've had dry, which when we get the fires and everything cooks and stuff. And last year we had them pretty bad in the year before. This year we've got the rain, so which normally it's been unreal for the marlin fishing as well. Normally you get the rainy season for the rain and it just yeah, slows them down. So hot weather every day and good for drinking beers. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot. Well, <clears throat> you know, I I first uh, found out about you probably, I don't know, four years ago or something like that. I was flipping through Netflix and then I came across your show Fishing with Mates when it, you know, when it first started airing on Netflix over here in the States. And uh, man, I just like watched every episode and uh, it was great, man. I really enjoyed it. And I loved how, you know, you had some stuff over in australia and then the rest of the world and you and you did several shows over here you know especially like over in venice with the um journey south charters and all that and uh, those guys and uh, i'll be going to venice in two weeks i'll be over there on the 15th so we're going tuna fishing and wahoo fishing i can't wait for that My so, dad's awesome, that place. yeah man that's awesome but uh but and then after i watch your show like I go to iCast and we sit down for lunch. And the next thing I know, you, you sat down right next to us and I heard your voice. And I was like, I looked over and I was like, look, there's Alan Levison right there. Do you know the funny thing? It's the voice that everyone recognizes. I thought it would be the good looks and great person. Ah. <laughs> Obviously, I, I misjudged that one because you get the voice. As soon as you talk, everyone turns around and goes, oh, yeah, I know that annoying voice. Yeah. And that's it. Every time it's the bloody voice. Yeah. yeah. The voice over or something instead. <laughs> But it was cool getting to meet you over there and we talked for a little bit and stuff. And uh, um, so that was, I really enjoyed that. And thank you for that time. But, uh, you know, I really wanted to have you on the show. We started the show up last year and really highlighting people that are doing awesome things in the fishing and hunting world. And uh, I had you on the list initially. So thanks for being on. That's so, it. That's, I like it. I like being at the top of the list. That's, a, that's where I normally Yeah. yeah. Actually, I don't, I'm normally at the bottom list is the like the, the reserve <laughs> version. <laughs> So, but, uh, you know, I really wanted to kind of um, spread the word about what, you, what you've been doing and stuff and your career and stuff. So do you want to tell us a little bit, just kind of growing up and what got you into fishing and, and the hunting and, and kind of how that kind of transpired into where you're at now? Well, you know, the great thing is, so like my old man, like most of us introduced us. So as a kid, all we ever did was go fishing and hunting. After school, weekends, yeah, I remember... The old man had a huge fight with him at school because we have to do Saturday sport, like the school sport. And he goes, no, 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 we're skiing this weekend. Next weekend, we're hunting. The weekend, we're after fishing. And we played rugby and all that. And they're going, oh, no, you need to be doing you need to be doing school sport. And he goes, no, he's not. He's coming with us. So we always, and me and my brother were both always obsessed with it. And, and it was, the funny thing for me is that when I was at school, you know, they're always you got to be a lawyer, you've got to be a doctor, you've got to be this, that, whatever, an engineer or whatever the hell it is. And they get, you know, get careers master, he goes, right, Al, what are you going to do? And I went, I'm going fishing. He goes, no, 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 that's not a job. He goes, what you do is you go to school, you get your grades, you go to university, you know, college, and then you get a job and you earn heaps of money. And then in your spare time, you can afford to go fishing. And I went, now nah, stuff it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go fishing and work out how to turn that into a business. And they went, you can't do that. Impossible. Of course, now everyone's turned around and, you know, turned their passion into a career. I started ages ago for that. Yeah. Funny, I was too dumb to do anything else too. So, you know, it worked all right anyway. So, yeah, and it just built up. And I started at the very start. I tried doing um, guiding for a while and I hated it because 
some people were awesome, they appreciate it, but some people just didn't appreciate the stuff they saw. Like we took a bloke out to cans to black marlin fish and all that and hooked him up first day, 800 pounder. Perfect Oof. big girl, did everything she's meant to, jumped and carried on, got her up, wrapped on the leader. I've got some awesome picks, shook her head, hooks came out and swam off, just like the perfect fish. Yep. And he goes, turns around and goes, see, they're not that hard to catch. And the crusty old deckhand, the mate turns around and goes, mate, you don't catch them. We catch them. You just wind them up for us. <laughs> he just walked off and I went, what he says. <laughs> like, you know, and I thought, I don't want to go and show people that don't appreciate it. Like, it's so awesome what you get to see on the water. Stuff yeah. that. And so then I went and worked in um, retail for a while doing, you know, working for the tackle shops and all that. Because I had this great idea that I could go get all the new gear cheap and go fishing. So I end up getting sacked from that because apparently you're not meant, you're meant to go to work and open the store. You're not meant to go, well, the fish are on, so you go fishing. And apparently that wasn't the way it works. You know, everyone went, you can't do that. And I'm like, what? No, I just went fishing. So, <laughs> so yeah, and then I started writing for the magazines and mm -hmm. it built up for a while there and I was doing all the magazines and just started taking photos and building on it and building on it more and more. And it started, yeah, developing. And then my old man actually went to Harvard. So he did marketing at Harvard. And when oh. he came back, he said, oh, you know, this is what you got to do. And this is, this is it. And, um, you know, this is amazing. This is what you need to do. He goes, but remember, if, you got, if you're passionate about it, you don't, your photos aren't sort of a, um, you know, you don't just go and do, take photos and think they're awesome. You're selling a product. It's, it's a product. So the editors have got to like it. The people are going to like it. So you're just selling a product. So we started doing more and more of that. And then I started building it and building it. And then, yeah, I think they're back in the early 2000s. We we're doing marlin mags, sport fishing, salt water, blue water, you know, French magazines. I think they're doing 20 titles a week. Modern fishing. We're just doing titles all over the place and just building and building. And suddenly realized that that's, that was, you know, I found that passion that was getting the photos and doing all that side of it. Yep. And just absolutely, yeah, blitz for us. And, and everyone goes, oh, you know, you get a lot of these young ones going, oh, how much money do you make out of it? Go, it's not about the money. So I get to go fishing and do what I love every single day. So I never work a day in my life. And then yeah. it just built up from there. You know, Derek just kept going and going. And then I said, right, you do that. Then I'm going to do books. Then I'm going to go into TV and then build it. And it took, it's the old thing. You're an overnight success after 10 years. That's the basic yeah. thing. It takes that bloody long to do sometimes and it comes up and you, you end up doing it and it's just, you know, one of those things that it's, oh, I don't know, it's just frustrating as hell. You, you, you keep building it up and building it up and keep going, but you never, I'll never do it for the money at any stage. Like it's one of those things you just keep doing because you love doing it. But the gratification of getting it right, like the other day we were down at Shimano and it's on my Instagram the line. I didn't even know they'd done it because I mean, I was... for them. and it's got this massive mural. It's like, I don't know how long it was. How long's the mural? Was? It's like 10 meters long or 15 meters long, or 15 meters long. Yeah. And all my photos all collaged together and stuff. It's just, oh, it looked awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was... I've seen it. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, that, it's, it's funny how it's progressed. So, it used to be when I was young catching the fish. Then it started being in the early days doing the marlin photography, you know, and this is talking slide film, not doing, you know, what everyone's doing these days with, you know, digital is so much easier. And I think it was us, it was over your way, Scotty Kerrigan, John Ashley over here, um, Richard Gibson, there are only a few people really doing it. So when I started getting the hang of it, man, we're selling them left, right and centre. I remember getting a photo of a guy out of Sydney, and they backed him down on this fish and they didn't know what they were doing. And this guy's climbed over the back to tag it and it, like to put the tag pole in. So he's like standing over the back of the boat. They pulled the boat out of gear, this big striped marlin about you know, 120 kilos, so 250 pounds is sitting there. And I've gone, this fish is going to jump. So I've got the wide angle. It jumps all right and spears him square in the butt. It comes Ooh. up over the side of the boat and gets him. But the jaw hits the bottom of the boat so it doesn't actually pierce. And at the same time, Doug Olander from Sport Fishing Bag had sent like an, an email going, oh, I'm looking for some photos of deadly fish. And I went, oh, I've got a pretty good one for you. 
I said, I just shot a photo of a marlin spearing a bloke up the clacker. And he said, oh, I have no idea what clacker means. So I sent like a photo, because it was a slide film, I sent it like a version of it to him and he goes, oh, I was pretty much on the money for that. Yeah, that's what it was. So it ended up being the big double page spread and all that sort of stuff. But but now it's so much easier that with, you know, digital and it's now it's doing the underwater. That's obviously the big passion for us because yep. you see, like today we had the little black marlin swim around beside the boat. Didn't want to catch him. All I wanted was my gear so I could have jumped in next to him and filmed him underwater, you know. Sitting there beside us, like it's like, oh, look at that, you know. So bloody awesome when they're like that. Man, yeah, I uh, I got lucky and caught my first sailfish here off Texas uh, last summer, and uh, man, it was a nice one. It's about eighty and eighty pounds. I don't know, I can't think what oh, kilos. Wow. Probably thirty five, forty kilos maybe. And uh, man, it was a big one for here. And uh, man, just seeing them all lit up. But uh, he had two giant lemon sharks chasing him after we oh, hooked really? up with them. So we were like trying to get him up, you know, get away from the sharks and get him in and release quick. And, uh, and he was all good. We got him in and got some couple quick shots and, and back in the water and revived and, and off he went. So, but, uh, cool. but uh, yeah, but we've, we've caught a, we've caught a few Marlin here. I've never seen a black in person, but man, they sure look good on TV. So. Man, so cool. It's funny, isn't it? Because we see so many of them here. You know, that you get them, you get the big ones up north, you get them all the way down the coast, so all the way along the, the east coast. On the mm -hmm. west coast, you get them all the way along there. The problem with the west coast is kind of like, I suppose, your east coast up in the northeast there, the shelf is miles out. Yeah. Like the continental shelf here of Sydney is seven, eight miles. That's it. Yeah. And we've been fishing down at Jarvis Bay, it's 10 miles. And if you go down to Bermagui down south, it's eight miles. You know, your thousand fathoms. 12 miles offshore, you know, it's just yeah. that miles. Like, you know, we have to do a big run. We're like, oh man, we've got to go like drive for an hour. This sucks. This is terrible. You yeah. know? <laughs> but you know, all that life comes in, they spill over. And we've been trying to get a photo of a black marlin jumping with the like the harbor in the background. But every time we hook one of the little bastards, they go straight out to sea. And we're trying to drive the boat around and find it, get the photo when it's jumping up. Nah, in fact, I put one up the other day, we caught one just of Sydney and in slow-mo jumping and he did this massive air. He must have cracked 15, 18 foot in the air like he's just flowing up and just crashed down. Mm. Of course, facing the sea, if he turned around and faced the other way, it would have been awesome. But all right, we'll just go back out tomorrow and see if we can get him. <laughs> Shoot. Well, um, what, uh, what year did you start doing the TV stuff? So was that with the Strike Zone or was that, was that the first yeah. show you started doing or? <laughs> So Strike Zone, we did as DVDs back in the, oh, I think it was 2000 and, I'm going to say 2005, 2006, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. I made a mate as a cameraman and we said, let's do a fishing one because no one was really doing fishing shows over there. We said, over here, I said, let's do our own thing. And I said, but what we want to do is make it like a blue planet. Let's film the bike. So we built a camera, lipstick camera, built a housing for it cable all the way up, little, you know, uh, Sony DV box, which, are, you know, it was all taped still in those days. Yeah. We'd have a recording and you'd watch. I still remember the first first time we put in, we tied a, like a live little goggle eye to the back of it and we're put in the water and we're tying it around the corner. The camera's upside down, so the fish is swimming along upside down like we put the fins the wrong way around. And all these kingfish, these yellow tails, came screaming up and smashed it right in front of us. And we're like, oh man. That is good. <laughs> and now we've filmed like, you know, Great Whites. We've done Mako Sharks in Sydney Harbour. We've done, you know, Marlin on bait balls, all these things. And Strike Zone, that really kicked it off that it blitzed. And then that sort of led into the TV. And then that from there, so when we did Strike Zone TV, and then we did, um, next one after that was, uh, we did, what did we do after that? We did, uh, Big Fish Small Boats, did a series mm -hmm. on that. I think we did three years of that. And then we've done other seasons as well. I did a couple of seasons for Monster Fish over there for, I think it's for the Outdoor Channel. They wanted a yep. big swordfish. So I said, yeah, no worries, we're going to do that. Went and caught a 500 pounder on the second day. I went, see, told you we could do it. We're going, God, that's the biggest one we've ever caught, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I texted you or messaged you last year uh, when we were up at the one of the hunting ranches, and uh, that one of the uh, that episode came on. Yeah, and I was like, "Hey, man, we're sitting here watching you while we're out deer hunting." So, yeah, hunting and monster you know, fish. Yeah, like, yeah. And the best part with that one is it just he got gut hooked. We we're going to kill him because we're going to eat him, and he got gut hooked. So we had him in the boat. We had him to the boat in forty five minutes. And then took us another hour to get the bloody thing in the boat. Like, we just couldn't get him in. It was just too big. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was gold doing that. So, yeah. and that's the thing. The fishing's taken us. It's like to all these amazing places around the world. But it's also all the awesome people. Like, you know, us catching up and all the people we've met. Like you're saying, Chris Fisher before and all these people. Like, he came out to Australia and with his wife and kids. And I was showing them around. I took them down to the Sydney Game Fishing Club over the harbour there and took them for a tour around to show them. And he had his daughters there and my two sons were there and they're standing on the edge just playing around. And I think Cooper, the younger one, just goes up and pushes the girls in the water, like pushes them off the pier. Like we do it all the time. And of course, mother's like, ah! The other one's laughing at I'm just going, oh God, who's kidding me? <laughs> oh. I'll have to ask Chris about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chris pisses himself about it. You know, he's going, oh. He's, he's better half is going, what about sharks? I went, oh, yeah, there's a few sharks around, but they'll be all right. That's my kids first, don't worry. So, yeah, it's bloody, it's unreal with stuff like that. Like, it's so, you know, it's so, it, it's the people you meet. It's uh, fishing attracts the best people you'll ever meet in the world and hunting as well. I mean, there's always a few dickheads and stuff in there, but the majority yeah. is just the best blokes around yeah. and girls. Yeah, the fishing community is awesome. And it always does a good job coming together, you know, and supporting stuff and stuff. And I know just from following you the last couple of years with everything that's been going on over there with the 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 issues with the no fishing zones and all that. I mean, you you gotta have a strong community to help fight some of these things. It is ridiculous in this country. So when I went and fished over your way and did the Everglades and all that, like that's a massive national park. The, the rangers are there going, oh, go down here fishing, go here, you know, these beautiful big tarp and they're great fish, but you can't take them out of the water. You got it. And I went, this is proper management. Right. In Australia, they go, we're going to lock up this massive bit. And if you drive in there, like, and go past it, and you have anything attached to your rod, and I'm meaning like a swivel, a sink or anything, $500 fine and um, a black mark against your name. So I went to town on these dickheads, pardon the pun, I swear when, yeah. when I'm dealing with these idiots. But they did it so badly at Port Stephens, which used to be one of our premier marlin spots, at the boat ramp, they put a sanctuary zone around the boat ramp. So you can't get out of the boat can't ramp. Can't even launch. Can't even launch. So if you launched, wow. by law, you'd oh. have to have all your gear cut off. And I went, I had to go before the tribunal because it got so big, it had an inquiry into it and everything. And I went, everything I've ever written the fishermen is to be prepared before they get on the water. So you're telling me that I'm telling them to break the law. Mm -hmm. I said, that's done wrong. They're not fishing. They're just driving. They have to get through this transit, through this zone. And the Marine Parks has become a complete... Marine Parks as a whole are a good thing. Marine Park lockouts is crap. It just doesn't help. Like we had a big... It was funny. You'd love this. So the ABC for us is like a... Uh, a government sort of paid station, which is all the lefties that are all the radicals that hate fishing, hunting, everything. And so they had me on and some, I don't know, stupid scientists that think thought he knew everything. And this is the thing I've learned, some of them don't know anything about what they're talking. And he's on there going, you know, marine parks are great, fish, they breed in there and then they all flow over, which is the biggest load of rubbish on earth. So I went, all oh, right. Which marine park to strike marlin spawn in? And he goes, what do you mean? I went, well, you said all the fish spawn in the marine parks. Which one to strike marlin spawn in? And he goes, oh, mm, uh, uh, I'll, I'll have to get back to you. I said, well, hang on. You're the scientist. Right. I know where they spawn. You tell me where they spawn. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and I went, I'll tell you where they spawn. It's the bottom end of the Coral Sea, out towards New Caledonia, out in that water. So I said, what possibly... The marine park's doing for striped marlin. Nothing. And I said, let's start naming the fish that do breed in there. And he goes, oh, snapper. I went, no, they don't. And snapper for us is more like a pogey for you guys. I said, no, they don't. They, they move with the water temperature. So they may spawn in one for a little bit. I said, and if then all of a sudden the host goes, well, hang on, you're saying that 
Well, if that's right, then these things are all a waste of time. I went, yeah, we've got to manage wow. the things. You've got to manage these bloody things and look after them. It's not, you know, and unfortunately in Australia, fishermen have got this bad name that, you know, some of the idiots that have wrecked it forever, and I'm not sure why we've got such a bad name, that we're destroying the environment because the greens are so, like, they're scary how radical the greens are over here. Mm -hmm. but, you know, and it just, we just don't seem to be, we've got better and we're getting stronger now, but it should never have come to this. Fishermen and even commercial, like a lot of commercial fishermen are really good. They've got bad eggs, we've got bad eggs, but they're all minorities. The key is that fishermen are your biggest custodians of the water, full stop. Yep. The greenies I fight with don't go there. So how can they even argue when they don't even know what they're talking about? Like I had to go down to Canberra to Parliament, so to uh, which is like your Capitol Hill and all that. Mm -hmm. See the ministers when they were starting to implement some marine parks, and they go, Oh, well, we're going to do these remote reefs. Actually, it was one of the ones I filmed for Monster Fish, which was out in the Coral Sea, um, wreck reef, and all that. So it's 400 miles offshore, it's a series of atolls that's just unreal fishing. And the only boat that goes out that far is all catch and release, apart from the odd wahoo and stuff that's going to die. Right. Every let go and you just eat what you've got and so you're really limited with what you don't get and kill much and they're going on so according to the, the report the government report no recreational fishermen go there and I went I was there last week mm -hmm. and they go oh right I went and you know what it's all catch and release the fishermen are the best one I said we have massive issues with foreign fleets sneaking in fishermen in your front line they can be sitting there going there's a boat in here and then we can send you know the the Navy or the whatever it is that we do, you know, out there to go and have a go. Otherwise, no one's doing anything. They can come and go as they please. So we are changing it slowly, but it's still incredibly frustrating that you're arguing with people that have never been there and have literally no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are good at talking about stuff they have no idea about. So social um, media. It's yeah. Like, yeah. A, exactly. <laughs> man, man, it's a, uh, definitely a double-edged sword so but um um you know over here uh, especially like in the gulf of mexico right now i mean we're having not a closure but a really you know an ongoing battle over the american red snapper and uh just the 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 laws regulating that and, and the fights you know the states fighting to control you know their areas and stuff and uh, uh you know it's it's been a it's been a crazy last 10, 15 years messing with that. So, but we don't have complete closures, you know, like in Florida, you know, there's been several uh, moratoriums on keeping fish, but it's mostly environmental caused, you know, like red tide or something where there's a big fish kill. It's not just saying you can't go in there and you can't keep anything, you know, from that, like over there, which I just can't believe they, they do that. Yeah. It's so. just, we have some real, draconian sort of laws that and it's where it's real sort of you know you can't think for yourself they have to control everything and we've got more bureaucrats than people in this country i reckon mm -hmm. sometimes but you know and it's all this you know it's like our environment departments and all that even our fisheries their conservation sector with all these radicals that we're trying to shut down everything and you sit there going you don't even go out there like you don't even yeah. do it you don't talk to them like it was an interesting one for me was longliners and, and wreck fishermen used to hate each other or game fishermen used to hate each other. So I met one of the commercial blokes and said, Rightio, I can't have an opinion on what you do unless you take me out. And he goes, oh, I'm not taking you lot out, you know, rah, rah, rah. You, you, all you do is abuse us, you don't understand. I said, take me fishing. I'll write a story up. If you don't like what I write or we don't agree, we'll shake hands and walk away. But take me fishing and show me what you do longlining so I can learn. And our long lining fleet is so heavily regulated, like they've got cameras on, so they're full-time cameras, so you can't literally do anything, you know, the whole time. Anyway, went out and fished for, I don't know, a week at sea and, you know, catching big eyes, blue fin, yellow fin, caught a couple of marlin, so they're allowed to take striped marlin, but blacks and blues they have to, have to release, which they don't ironically catch any. It's really weird. They don't catch bugger rules, uh, blacks and blues, yet we can fish next to them. They'll catch a couple of stripes and we'll catch blacks. Go figure. <laughs> anyway, at the end of it, I came away going, oh, wow, this is really heavily regulated. Like, 
they got bird policies. If a bird lands on your boat, that's an interaction. Yeah. If you have, uh, and I'm not sure what it is at the moment, if you have five interactions in a month, you shut down. So it is like the regulations are insane. Like we're really good with. It. So I came away going, wow. And said, right, what we need to do to start getting you guys working with our guys so we're stronger so that when we have this green element, which Australia seems to have a terrible, Europe has it as well. You guys don't seem to have the, the real radicals. Like they, I'd call them terrorists. I get in trouble for it all the time. But it basically it's their view or no, or you're dead. Like, so it's terrorists. And we'll get in trouble for that for sure. But anyway, you can just palm that off on me. And they're just, it's completely wrong. And it's, it's, they're so obsessed with it. Like we had a classic there, went out to a fancy dinner. This will give some of the guys that listen what we deal with. Went out to dinner and this lady goes, I can't believe you go hunting and kill stuff. I said, I only hunt for food. I said, I'm only interested. I see a deer run down the hill. All it is is a barbecue just going past me. And they're going, she goes, well, that's cruel. I don't believe it. I said, let me, so let me guess. You're one of those full on greenies and all that sort of stuff. And she's like, Yep, I'm only, was it the vegan where you don't eat anything? And I said, righty up. let's start with your shoes. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, the leather, what do you do? Skin the poor thing alive and just wear it? So you're vegan. That's not vegan. Oh, 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 oh. And I said, you drink milk? And she goes, oh, I can drink milk. I'm allowed to do that. You know, it's, I don't know. And I said, you know how we get milk, right? And she goes, yes, it comes from a cow, but it's natural. I went, you take the calf away. Like it's not, you know, I said, you got to understand, so you got, oh, well, that's not, uh, I don't want to talk to you about this. Yeah. So that's the mentality we deal with in this country is some, man, we got some some real dumb asses at that end. And mm -hmm. the problem is that we get less people out fishing and less people outdoors because they regulate it so heavily that all of a sudden you go, it's too hard. So we've got a massive issue in Australia with the younger generation not fishing because of these marine parks. So they can't go down to a wharf and throw a line in Oh, it's closed. You can't do that. You can't go there. So for me, it's a massive thing. And you guys have got that Keep America Fishing and great things with us. It's, it's a real issue with kids that they're just not fishing enough because it's just too hard to do. You know, it's everything's regulated and you can't do this. You can't do that. And it's, it's a real worry for me going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I've, so I've spent a lot of time over in um, Germany. I was an exchange student over there and the family that I stayed with, um, the father actually ran the forestry department, which was in charge of the hunting and the fishing and, and the timber and all that. And uh, it was really, that, that was a perfect one to stay with. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was, and we're still awesome friends with them and see them a lot, but uh, it was really cool to see the differences in the regulations i mean it is so regulated for the hunting sides for sure and then you have to belong to a fishing club to be able to fish in certain bodies of water and all this and that and and uh but since he was in charge you know i got to go and, and do some of that with him but but uh you know you can't just go over there and hunt i mean you, you i feel like they had to apply to have their guns every year and if they harvested an animal they had to buy it back from the state if they wanted to keep it. Otherwise, it was sold to a restaurant or something. And uh, it's just, just crazy. So yeah, and that's the regulations that people don't realize that. So here, we can go. So if we go samba hunting. So samba deer is sort of very similar to an elk, probably just a tiny bit smaller. I think they're third largest. So what is it? Moose, elk, then samba. So because everything's introduced here. So none of it's native. So everything was all brought out by the English in the early days to acclimatise mm -hmm. and, you know, basically for sport. Down in Victorian southern New South Wales, there are millions of them now, all in national parks. So in Victoria, you can hunt in a national park. You get a, a permit, which is 40 bucks a year, and they allow hunting in there. And it's, it closes during the summer when there's more hikers, but during the winter when it's cold, when no one's there, you can hunt. Yeah. But... A lot of the others, we've got minimal, like pigs you can shoot all year because they're, yeah, they're just feral and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there's very little that we actually hunt. We've got six species of deer. And apart from hog deer, which are heavily regulated because we're the only place on earth you can hunt hog deer. So hog <laughs> deer are like a real small one that's, they're from Indonesia, uh, not from Indonesia, from Asia as well. So they're Asiatic deer, but they're only small. And they're only just a small population down in Victoria but they seem to be steady and stuff. So they're the ones that are, are regulated. But a lot of the others, 
there's minimal seasons and there's not much on it at all. So you don't have, there's not much of that side. But on our gun regulation, it can be quite hard. And it's interesting for me, I reckon you need to prove that you have the right to own a gun. You shouldn't be able to, and I know a lot of the guys in the US are sort of, it's the right to bear arms. But for us, I don't want some nufty with a gun. I want everyone that has to prove that they can. <clears throat> and I remember even when we did like a gun license, you go and do a course and, you know, mm -hmm. even then there's a bloke, they, the, the guy doing it hands the gun to him. He points it at him and goes, <laughs> and the guy's fucking looking at him. He goes, what's wrong with this picture? And he goes, oh, I don't know. And he's got the gun pointed at him. Everyone else is like, <laughs> it's like, you know, you shouldn't have a gun. Like, yeah. you know. So, so they're not too bad. They're probably a little bit over the top. Like they come and do inspections. So we actually get the police that come and inspect. And I, I'm renting at the moment, so I can't put my safe because you can't drill holes in. So all I did was put the, it's at a friend's safe around the corner, around the cops and went, look, my guns are here. This is where they're registered. They're registered to me, but they're in this is the address that the safe house that they're in. They went, yeah, no worries. So they've been really good with that side. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with our hunting, I suppose a lot of it, it's still largely we're just chasing imported species. You know, everything's, everything's foreign. But for us, we're trying to encourage it because they used to shoot them and leave them. We're going, no, utilise, like venison's, God, it's the best eating thing on earth. Yep. And we're trying to get it where you get more and more people to look after it. And, you know, same with our fish. Like we're doing a big thing at the moment on catching yellowtail that you have to bleed it and gut it and get it on ice and... And when you cut up a fish to utilise the whole fish, we do it a lot with a thing called Tuna Champions, which we did with Southern Bluefin Tuna, which was that big documentary I did on them. And it's an awesome example where fish have come back. So Southern Bluefin Tuna, we pretty much, between Japan and Australia and to a lesser degree New Zealand and a few other countries, we annihilated them. Absolutely destroyed the population. And as a kid, I never, ever saw a bluefin. Now, there are so many bluefin that they're catching them down in Victoria, inshore, all the way across. So South Australia's got them, Victoria's got them, and even in southern New South Wales, they're not meant to be here yet. They and they're not meant to be here for another three months. They're catching them. Wow. Tasmania's to catch them. So the numbers are coming back up, but it's purely because they're managing it and looking after stocks and, and the quotas are a lot more regulated, but on an international scale. So no marine parks, nothing. But what we had was, and it's interesting, and you guys have probably had a similar thing, is that we'd catch a tuna as, you know, when I'm younger, put it on the deck and go, oh, that's awesome, take it home and cut it up and it tastes like crap. Now we have to gut and gill them, pack them with ice mm -hmm. and look after them, which I learned from doing the long lining with that mate Shane, going, oh my God, I never knew. So the education is what we're really pushing here is trying to show people, going, understand how to look after these fish and, and do it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think of it like, like when you harvest a deer, I mean, you don't let it sit out there for, for a day or something. I mean, you try to get it gutted and cleaned as, as fast as possible. And uh, man, taking care of that meat from the fish, no matter what species it is, man, it makes such a big difference in the taste. It's, it's yeah. crazy. And it's funny because so. oh, man, when I used to fish there at the man, we'd put, you had a shopping, uh, like a, a um, clothes basket, you'd chuck the fish in there and you'd sit there all day. Now we're catching them, we're spiking them, we're gutting and gilling, they're processed on ice. Like Coop's caught 135 kilo bluefin, so what's that, 250, 270 pounds, yep. caught it, and it was too big, so we're packing ice on it. It's too big for the, for the mantis bag we had for it. So we're packing ice on it, we went straight in, so we gave up, we caught it first thing in the morning, 40 miles offshore, drove straight yep. in, packed it with ice, got it home, let it set where we could keep it actually thing, and then spent two days processing it and ate the last bits the other day. Like, it's amazing how, you know, you can do this and you look after it all that time. Mm. And you, think you put so much effort into it, you may as well make it good. And people go over here, oh, tuna doesn't freeze that well. Freeze is awesome if you do the right, if you yeah. look after it. In the first three minutes, if you haven't started the process, it's deteriorating. So from that point on, the tuna's going downhill. So the longer you take, the worse it's getting. Yeah. So, yeah. And for us, I, I take great pride in it now going, whatever fish we catch, like we've got whiting there. We call them King George whiting, which are probably one of the best eating fish. And, you know, we do them all, stack them in. We call it freezer pride now. So they're all stacked neatly in the freezer. Pull them out, eat them. It's bloody awesome. 
man. Well, um, I wanted to ask you, um, growing up, I mean, you, you knew what you wanted to do in all this. What was it like growing up in Australia? I mean, did you have a lot of people to look up to in the fishing world, you know, back then, you know, that were, that were doing big things or TVs, you know, like over here, I mean, we've obviously got, you know, some fishing legends that were icons from back in the day, like Bill Dance and Jimmy Hughes, Roland Martin, Foot Pallet, all, all these guys that are still doing it now. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. We didn't have, so obviously we're a smaller population, but there were a few, which was, there was a magazine called Modern Fishing, which I ended up writing for years later, which is like one of those great things. We used to read it every month and you read about it. Um, and there were a few blokes there in the hunting and fishing that just wrote for like, there was a, a shooting magazine called Sporting Shooter. And, but there was, there weren't as many, we had Rex Hunt, obviously, who was a great ambassador in the early days for fishing. So he was always a great one. And he pretty much had the first proper TV series that was fishing. The ironic thing is over here, the major networks, which we don't have it as, uh, as um, cable TV, it's free to wear where you have two or three major networks and it's all advertising that, that runs it. Mm -hmm. And they would fought tooth and nail that fishing wasn't a business like for ages. It took forever to get on. I remember when Rex Hunt started on TV, it started at 11.30 at night was when they ran it. And I can remember my parents going, you can start up and watch it. Like, you know, I can't remember what it's seven or eight or whatever it was. And that was a big thing that you're allowed to stay up, that it was that. Now there's dozens of shows and we've got more channels too now. So we've probably got free to air. So the ones you don't pay for, I think 15, 18 channels. So oh. yeah, it's much bigger. And you've got like seven mate, which are linked to the outdoor channels. So they, they've got a lot of stuff there that obviously we run with them now. And yeah, it, it's changed a lot. But in the early days, probably the biggest one I remember was a bloke called Harry Butler. And he was like an outdoor conservationist that would go. And he was on TV with a gun, which was a, a complete no-no <laughs> because he was shooting feral cats while he was looking for some bird. And he goes, well, I think you're well, wondering why I've got the gun. Well, I've got the gun because I'm shooting the cats, the feral cats, because feral cats over here are just, because we haven't got any native predators like that that can climb trees. Man, those things are just deadly in this country. They're just annihilating everything. So, so you, yeah, don't, you, mean, you don't have Tasmanian devils running around everywhere? <laughs> no, the poor little buggers. So we've got them down in, in Tasmania, which is pretty much the only spot there at the moment. And I think they've got them out on some, some island or something. We've put them because they're in such trouble. They get these massive cancers and no one knows where they're coming from. Like it's grotesque and the, mm. it's really smashed the population and no one has any idea where it comes from or what That's it crazy. is. That's it's crazy. It's bizarre. So you see them, it's funny when you're down there fishing, trout fishing or down in Tassie up in the highlands there, you see them running around like, cause you get lots of roadkill for us. Like there's wallabies and you know, little marsupials, little sort of rat things that we you hit them with the car all the time, you know, and they just live on the roads eating dead shit all the time you know they yeah. love it there's roadkill everywhere it's the best thing for them maybe they eat, i don't know what they're getting the cancers from but they're cool little creatures but yeah, yeah. they're only down in tassie <laughs> that's crazy yeah so so i've heard that that feral cats are really bad over there along with the the feral hogs and stuff because i mean over here the feral hogs are just insane especially here in texas i mean we've got i've got pictures after pictures of 30 40 wild pigs on a camera, you know, at my where I hunt for deer at, you know, and, and they'll just come in and wipe it out. Yeah, then we get the same. They've probably dropped down a bit because hunting's so popular now. I mean, I remember as a kid, you'd go out five hours from home and there'd be yeah, you know, into the western swamps there and all that, and be pigs everywhere. There's still yeah. a lot around. You get them up in the high country here, you get these mountain boars, which are real switched on and hard to hunt. So we still have lots of pigs, but it's deer that the populations are going escalating. And deer are a lot quieter too. So pigs, mm -hmm. you notice them. Deer can be living, you know, in your back garden, literally, and people wouldn't know unless they were hunters. Yeah. So it's interesting to see. So deer numbers have escalated. So as a kid, when I used to go and hunt Samba deer, if I saw one in four or five days, I was excited. I've seen in, in a day now, 20 and 30 in a day walk around. 
you're on the side of the road, the river, like the population has gone uh, mm. through the roof. But we've got so much backcountry there where they can live that it's, yeah. They've started aerial shooting them again, which is a bit, we don't believe in that. I don't think they should be shooting them from the air or they're dropping poison on them, which they drop 1080 and they do it in New Zealand as well. They try and poison them and put carrots or something down. So everything eats it. Like, right. Yeah. yeah, like it's real smart. So it kills all the natives, kills everything. So yeah, we've we've got some issues with these sort of again, same bureaucrats. They just let's get rid of it. Let's make it like it was. You're not going to be able to do that. You can't. You change yeah. everything. You know. Yeah, they uh, tr they tried doing something like that here in Texas, um, some kind of poison, um, but it man, it didn't fly, so it didn't really happen. But uh, there it was. There was a whole big uproar about that. But um. You know, here, I mean, we've got a, you know, you know, the pigs are a big problem, but we've got all these big ranches that imported all these exotic deer and stuff from other countries and uh, the axis, you know, the yeah. axis deer from, from India and stuff, man, they are in some places, there's more axis now than whitetail. And um, it's, it's crazy. Which they're very good eating, but, yeah, um, you know, they're really different. pushing the native species out of certain areas. So, um, well, that's interesting because we've got them here, but we've only got a small population up in Queensland and they haven't expanded. There's a couple of others starting to pop up further south, but there's not been that many up, you know, like the population there has been very set. It went very quickly and then stopped and it's just been the same number. But I reckon they're one of my favourite eating deer, those guys, the axes. They're bloody beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, um, so one of the other things I was wanting to ask you was, and one thing that I've noticed and everybody's noticed over here was since the coronavirus pandemic started last year, you know, it started out as kind of, um, you know, really crippling over here in the U S I mean, it hurt a lot of industries like the fishing industry took a big hit initially and, um, a lot of jobs were lost and things. I mean, I know, you know, you know, a lot of people in the, in the industry and stuff and, and, um, and it seemed like after about two, three months, you know, everybody just got fed up of being inside and they all went outside and we had this huge influx of people going outdoors. Did the same thing happen over there or? 100%, absolutely. Yeah. And what's really interesting is because Australians travel a lot, suddenly we can't travel like at all. So some, to even some extent, it's even states. So I went down to Victoria. So you got New South Wales and then Victoria. We went down to Victoria and there was a little corona outbreak in New South Wales. And the Premier down in Victoria, who's, I, he's half mad. He just wants to be, you know, he just goes, right, we're blocking the border. No one can come into Victoria. You know, just the, the towns are on the border. You can't do it. Like, it's just madness. But everyone is fishing. So here in Sydney, we run down the river that goes underneath the Harbour Bridge arguably probably 100 plus times a year. And in the last three months, pretty much since this has started, you know, you go to the same spot, oh, that's the same person fishing there, the old bloke, you know, oh, that's the same boat over there. It's like, who are they? Where do they come from? Who are these yeah. people? It's gone through the roof. And the industry has gone from, you know, bankrupt to booming. It's been like fishing. is We can't get any gear. The biggest problem we've got is getting stock. Yep. Mercury have been blitzing with their, obviously with their new engines. We can't get gear because obviously everyone in the US and everyone else is doing it as well. So all of a sudden they're like, going, no one's got enough, you know, yeah. no one's got any product anymore. Yeah. And there's no, there's no lures, there's no weights, there's no motors, there's no boats. <laughs> Kayaks yeah. are all sold out. I mean, over here, I mean, RVs and travel trailers. I mean, you couldn't find anything. And uh, we're just now starting to see more stock come in and stuff and uh we actually just had this past weekend our first big fishing show um where a lot of local vendors here in texas came together here near galveston and uh it was cool to see everybody come out and and uh it was mostly all outdoors you know and everybody was safe and everything but it was cool seeing everybody together again and uh enjoying time and, and um buying fishing stuff yeah, well, that's the thing. I miss it because you've got all your boat shows and obviously your trade shows and all of a sudden it's a year of nothing. But yeah. none of those social events, you know. I like, no, there's no better excuse to go and get on the beers and get on the cans with the boys and stuff. <laughs> all of a sudden it's like, I don't know, we haven't been to anything. 
Like, you know, boat noise and stuff. It's just bizarre how it's come to such a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see what happens. The one good thing is we've got more people fishing and hopefully, going back to what I was saying before, is now we've got an opportunity to get heaps more kids back out fishing. And, and of course, we're also <coughs> competing with bloody video games. You know, they can sit down going beep, 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 or we can get them out fishing. So yep. pushing really hard here. And, I mean, that's one thing I think that I want to... I've had the best career on earth out of fishing. Like you could not, it is the best job on earth. And I want to try and put back into making it. And I've always had the thing, it's not a sustainable fishery. I want to enhance it so it's actually better. When you and I go fishing, we catch say four red fish. Our kids go out and they catch 10. That's what I want to see is that there's yep. more and more for the future. So that's a big thing for me is that, you know, now more people are doing it. We really push that appreciation. Go, this is the time we really want to do this, and people, you know, really understand what it's about. So, yeah, yeah, and I mean, I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, getting these kids out, but um, just providing the opportunities, you know, that's the number one thing, you know, and 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 education and stuff. So, you know, we do a lot of that over here. I mean, we've got our, our youth program that we do. You know, I talked to you yeah, about we when we first met and stuff, and. And uh, I mean, those kids just blow me away how in tune they are with, with conservation. And, and some of them aren't, you know, they're new to it. And by the end of the week at our camp and stuff, they're, they're rocking and rolling and um, bringing more kids into the fold. So uh, need more of that for sure. A hundred percent. The IGFA do it as well. We're trying to do it where we integrate it into the schools as well. We've noticed an interesting thing or quite an alarming thing that in university or colleges, is that's where these greenies are reading, I suppose you could say, mm -hmm. uh, and pushing the pushing the agendas of no one go fishing, no one go outdoors, hunting is cruelty. You know, we get that that Peter crowd, that protection, what do they call themselves? People for ethical treatment of animals or yeah. pretty tasty food or something, I think it's called. I'm not sure what they are, but they're full on. They were telling us you can't shear a sheep. Yeah. Like, what the hell? If you don't shear the poor things, they get fly blind and then get eaten alive by maggots. Like, you just it's just dealing with idiots you know yeah we've got a uh, we've got pete over here for sure and uh you see a lot of bumper stickers around texas and uh that actually stands for people eating tasty animals so i reckon that's a much better thing we're putting venison on tonight we've got sam Badir for dinner tonight so you know yeah. like that's for me i take great delight or pleasure in the fact that we supply our own food so we went down whiting fishing with my brother and and caught you know a heap of white and everything's processed and nothing's based we use the frames to go and catch beach worms to go and catch more to get as bait to catch more whiting so you, you you're in tune with nature and you utilize it we went mm -hmm. and shot a deer cleaned the whole animal down processed it all cryovac everything so now we're eating that as well and all the bones the dogs are eating so you don't you're not wasting anything meanwhile these yep. people are telling you you're cruel for going fishing are going and buying canned tuna which has probably got dolphin in it or something, you know, from the bloody supermarket. Mm -hmm. And it's covered in plastic and it's, you know, the carbon footprint as a comparison would be blowing out compared to you and I going deer hunting and, you know, harvesting an animal to feed our families. It's, we've got to get that, that mindset around that this is what we've done for billions of years. Yes, we've changed the way we do it, but if we still do it and utilise the animal and only take what we need, you're in, you're in tune with nature. It's very simple. Yeah, yeah. And I just watched the uh, the bluefin doc documentary again recently, and uh, I mean that's just it perfectly explains that whole process. You know how it was before, why it wasn't sustainable. Look what happened to the stock of the bluefin tuna over there, and then look where it is today. You know, making a rebound just because of sound management and and good fishing practices. And you know the best part is that the science they're using for it is undisputable. So it's all DNA and it's done in a way with gene pool DNA testing that we know exactly what the population is. So there's no, you can't have these idiot greens carrying on and, and saying something. It is undisputed because they've, and now they use that same DNA testing for other species, whether it be great whites, whether it be, you know, other tuna species as well. Mm -hmm. So it all, the crux of it all came from that Southern bluefin because it was the first one that got absolutely annihilated. And now they look out for them. And the funny thing is, they only spawn in the northwestern corner, sorry, the north 
northwest of yeah, northwestern corner of the Indian Ocean. That's the only spot on earth they spawn, and it's bizarre. The weird thing is they come all the way around, so the coral sea is a really rich environment on the east coast of Australia. Mm -hmm. Everything else spawns at the bottom end of that. These bluefins from all the way up the east coast as far as Brisbane, so they're only 100 miles, 200 miles from where they should be, and what do they do? They turn around. There was a fishing report coming through yeah. then, so I'm ringing to see if the fish is good. And then they turn around from all the way back around the other side of Australia and all the way back up the other end. Wow. Either they like stupid bloody fish, you didn't have to swim that far, you could have just kept going north. But yeah, and because we know that now, now we're looking after them there. We're just, you know, to me, it's such an important part that we understand if we understand them, we can protect them. And that's, that's the big problem with marine parks. We spent billions of dollars on marine parks that have been a complete failure because we don't actually understand what we're doing. So if we yeah. understand the fish and can look after them, then we're done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to post a link for the, for the documentary in the show notes for this. So everybody can check it out. But uh, one of the things I noticed in there was the use of the fish farms, you know, the, the containments for, for growing them out. And um, that's something they've talked about doing over here. You know, offshore for species like uh, cobia and stuff, and uh, but it's pretty neat. You know how many fish they usually keep in those things, or yeah, I jumped in with them, and they're they've got us. I'm not sure there's, there's a set amount they've got in them, but they're feeding them and stuff that's unreal. But they're yeah. they're not really fish farms because they bring them from the wild and put them in there, and then you know, and it was because they had a quota, so they caught them at 15 kilos, and then built them up to 40 kilos and then sold them at 40 kilos, but the quota was based on the 15. So yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting going forward, they're going to shut down those farms because the wild fishery is so good. Right. So it's, it's, it, that's a real credit. It's actually turned it around. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be the other way. Yeah. So yeah, it's exciting. And that's the thing, the future is just, you know, there's a few things we're doing right. If we can use those as case studies, we can really start building on. Like you said earlier on, we've got massive issues with states trying to control it, and which is so frustrating because it's a fish that doesn't know the borders. So states are fighting with other states, which is all politics, not about the bloody fish. It's about control and power. And it's like, no, we're about the fish. And we're trying to get more Commonwealth, so federally run fisheries. So all any three miles offshore is federal in Australia. So Commonwealth waters, okay. well, they manage that which is a lot better because then you have one body managing the whole lot. And our bloody fish swim halfway around, like the tagging programs we've got are showing, you know, yellow-tailed kingfish are swimming from one side, almost well, from South Australia up into New South Wales. So they swim around a quarter of the country. So they're going mm -hmm. past all states. So we really need to get better and stop the politics, which we're seeing now with all the COVID stuff, you know, we got premiers and, you know, they're trying to be presidents and they're, it's like, guys, they're only interested in their own, in feathering their own pocket and being the, you know, the legacy that I was the one that saved the world and, you know, that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, we won't even get started on politics over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you guys are aware of all the crap that's been going on. So, but, uh, but man, um, well, you know, we've touched on a lot of stuff, but uh, I did want to get, you know, just a couple of your favorite memories. I mean, some of the coolest things you've done. I mean, I know everybody's probably seen the the shot of, you know, your Mako on the Marlin and all that stuff. But I mean, just off the top of your head, you know, what were some of your favorite things being in the water or on the end of, you know, on a fishing rod pulling on something? Well, there's probably a couple and I'll keep it down to 10 minutes because I know we're meant to be an hour and stuff, but Probably one of, the, I've done some, like obviously the Mako shark, which everyone's seen, you just put in the internet, is still one of those phenomenal things which are just out of this world. Mm -hmm. But other things like, so I jumped in, um, there was a big thresher shark that the, the mates had hooked and they let it go and I was swimming over their boat to film the release. And as I'm swimming over, this massive thing appears next to me, like this huge thresher shark just swims up to me, non-threatening, I mean, it's tight, obviously. And as it swims past, I've grabbed onto its tail and then it's just swum like, like a whale shark or something, you know, but an actual thing. And he just swam along holding onto this beautiful fish just going, oh my God, how good is this? You know, and he just, 
he just quite <laughs> unfazed by the whole thing and then just swam off and I let him go and, you know, did that jumping in on bait balls, striped mile and bait bullies. So you guys got to get that down in Mag Bay in Mexico. We get it on the south coast here, Australia, which is pretty much the only two plays that happens with any regularity. Mm. And same thing with dolphins and seals and stuff. And jumping in on that and seeing them swim up to you is insane. Like, it's just, it's amazing. Like, they come up to you. The real weird thing, when I've done on sailfish, sailfish don't care about you at all. They're not really that interested. Striped marlin will swim straight up to you and have a look at you. Wow. And people go, oh, it's so scary. I go, no, it is awesome. They never touch you. They come up, have a look at you, and then swim back and then come back past them with the camera just trying to shoot photos and, you know. Yes. So we talk the bluefin as well. Like, I've got some awesome photos where you troll, as soon as you hook up on these southern bluefin, start throwing um, sardines out, and they sometimes they come up, sometimes they don't. But I've had it where we've had 70, 80 kilo fish swim around the boat, and the guys are chucking poplars out. And they're smashing, like taking the hooks off. And you're swimming and they're getting pushed away by their wakes, you know, like, and you're out 40 miles offshore in the middle of the ocean and, like, it's just insane sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen some of the videos that you've shot with the ocean sunfish with the molas and stuff. And that's yeah. just incredible. And that's just off Sydney. Well, we did it. Coops, the young fella wanted to do one. He goes, I'd love to see. I went out and they're all out wide for whatever reason. They're cruising past. Went, oh, there's one there. So we went over to it and you get around in front. And the weird thing is, so we jumped in on this one and I swam up towards it, sort of swam away. It was like, they don't really stress about you. As soon as Coops got in the water, he swam, he swam straight over to it. So I'm trying to film it and it keeps swimming over to bloody Cooper and I'm trying to get the shot of this damn thing and it just kept going over to him. I mean, you're talking three quarters of a ton, like they're massive fish. Yeah. And it was quite crazy. Read one a couple of years ago that it swam up to one of the other divers with us. And he scratched it on the head. We normally try to avoid interactions, but it swam up and like laid there like a dog. So he scratched it. So it just laid straight back and he's scratching it going, am I meant to like, should I do this? Should I not? And he swam off and it starts following him and nudging him. He's going, so he just went back to scratch. It was like a dog, like it was bizarre. So, so that, and then there's obviously all the fish we've caught over the years. We've been, biggest black marlin I was there for, I took photos of was 1,280 pounds and oof. You try and tell people a fish that's that big, it is insanity how big they are. Like, it is ridiculous. They are absolute monsters. You know, I've been there with Billy Bilson, who's one of the, the, the better, or probably one of the best marlin fishermen up on, on the reef. He died recently, sadly. And we had, like, we caught three over the mark in one day. So three over a thousand in one day. Like, just yeah. insane fishing. And then... My, my biggest bluefin over caught, which I drove from Sydney, heard about the bite, drove 14 hours down to Victoria, went out and hooked one of these things and fought it for seven hours in 30 metres of water. Like, you just couldn't get close to it. And it was the big... I think it's still the biggest ever caught in Australia on 24 kilo on 50-pound tackle. Went, went 155 kilos, which is, what, 340, 330 pounds. Uh, my back's still paying for that, I'll tell you. <laughs> Bloody hell. Oh, man. Well, man, yeah, I, I, like I said before, man, we're going over to Venice uh, here in a couple weeks, and uh, I've got all my Halcos ready. We throw a lot of Halco 130 Maxes. And, oh, uh, nice oh man, that's a great lure. And uh, and so hopefully we'll get on a good bite for some elephant over there and, and catch a couple of Hoos and uh, – Man, wish she was here. You'd go with us. So I'd be keen. I'd be swimming over to them going, over here, they're just a few just Yeah, here. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I really hope, you know, when everything opens back up, you can make it over here to Texas. So we still got to go fishing. And uh, I'll make sure if you get over here, we'll get out and uh, maybe try to get out to the flower gardens or something, do some diving out there. So that would be we'll fun. Be yeah. I'm so. glad. Don't worry about that. We'll come over. I'll, I'll see if I can beat your daughter of those redfish, see if yeah. I can take you on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll do it, man. And uh, man, I want to get over there. I've always wanted to come to Australia, and one day I'll make it over there. So I'll uh, I'll come ring on the doorbell and see see if you got the boat in the water. So open in but, uh, you get here, we'll go fishing and hunting. Don't worry, I don't need an excuse for that. <laughs> well, that'd be awesome. So well, um, man, I think we've been on here for probably an hour or more. But uh, I just want to thank you for being on. 
and uh, all the stuff that you do and stuff. And um, you know, hopefully we'll get to see each other soon. Hopefully you can make it over for ICAST here in the next year or two. And um, yeah. And uh, you got any final thoughts or anything or? No, just apart from the fact I do want to get back over there. And if everyone likes it, we'll do another one. So if they all send, a, send you emails and messages, Derek, and say, you know, we'll put up with that Aussie again. We'll yeah. do another one then. All yeah, right. I'd love to, have, love to have you on again. So, yeah, we'll definitely do one if you get over here. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll do it in person. That'd be a real yeah, one. Yeah. So, but, uh, well, man, uh, thanks again. Tell everybody there we said hi, and um, we will see you on the water. Bloody oath, mate. All right. Thank you.